One of the reasons of the success of differential privacy is the fact that it's very user friendly. There's a number of nice properties that make it nice to reason about and put things together modularly. Uh, you don't really have to have a whole picture of the entire process in your mind all at once. And uh, yeah, you, you, can, you can sort of focus on individual pieces and then compose them or combine them. So we're gonna talk about some of the most fundamental properties which are very important for differential privacy and uh, you'll, we'll, we'll see how to prove each of them. So the first thing is uh, post-processing in the sense that differential privacy is closed under post-processing. What do I mean by that? I mean that suppose you run an algorithm on a, on a data set and then it gives you some output, some object is the output. Well, in that case, the resulting output will be differentially private. And no matter what you do on that output, as long as you don't touch the true data set again, then it'll still be differentially private. So kind of, if somebody gives you something and they tell you it's differentially private, then you can go do whatever you want, uh, like a runoff, sit in the corner, think very hard, but uh, you're not gonna be able to undo that differential privacy no matter what you do. So this is kind of, uh, we already used this once when analyzing randomized response because I said, you know, the vector of bits that you get is uh, private and then therefore adding them up will also be differentially private. But okay, so here's the theorem. Let's see how we sort of state this mathematically. We're going to let M be uh, so the algorithm, which is differentially private. It maps from some uh, domain and N elements to uh, some range. And we're going to let F be some arbitrary mapping, which is randomized potentially. And note that this takes the output of the algorithm and maps to some other um, range. Then the composition, um, it's not a great term for reasons we'll see shortly, but running F on the output of M on X, that'll also be epsilon differentially private. So let's see how to prove this. Um, the first thing that we're going to note is that this is a randomized mapping but that's not always the most convenient to uh, deal with. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine F is a distribution, uh, distribution over uh, like deterministic function, deterministic functions F. So these are each functions which map from Y to Z and uh, you know, this is a random distribution over them. So what are we gonna do? We're going to basically just do this from first principles in the sense that we're going to write the differential privacy guarantee. So we're gonna have some, you know, arbitrary T, which is a subset of, uh, I guess, uh, this Z set. So what we're going to do is just look at the, you know, this is the thing that we see in the definition of differential privacy. What we're going to do is like sort of decompose this in terms of uh, the deterministic functions which underlie it. So we can write this as, you know, expectation over um, F being drawn from this distribution of Fs. And then what we do here is we essentially just uh, invert each of the functions. So how do we do that? Well, we let m of x be in f inverse of t. Cool, so this is uh, how we would analyze that. We just, we just sort of invert this function and decompose uh, the randomized mappings into uh, its component uh, uh, deterministic mappings. And now at this point, you know, we're, we're almost done. What we do is we just apply the definition of differential privacy. We know that M is differentially private. So this is going to be less than or equal to um, E of F, F, and then E to the epsilon here, probability of M on X prime, where X prime is going to be a neighboring data set in F inverse of T. And now we undo the sort of mapping that we did. We can pull out this e to the epsilon now, and we just undo the exact same mapping that we did. And this is equal to e to the epsilon times probability of uh, f on m on x prime going to be in t. And that's it, that's the end of the proof.
all we did was we basically set up the you know thing we're trying to prove from first principles. We sort of inverted the mapping, then we uninverted the mapping, uh, inverting between deterministic and randomized functions, and then that's it. Really, not too bad. Um, in fact, none of the things we're going to see too are too bad. They're just a few line proofs at most. So the next step is group privacy. So up till this point, we're focused on neighboring databases. Like, what, what are we saying? Like, you know, so far we've been focusing on x, x prime, differ in one entry. Well, you know, this is kind of potentially limiting because of the fact that, uh, you know, what, what, we're not always going to consider databases which differ in exactly one entry. What if they differ in two entries? There's three entries. Well, the nice thing is that uh, group privacy is essentially the statement that differential privacy guarantees degrade gracefully. Um, so if uh, data sets differ in a few entries or several entries, then uh, we can quantify exactly how much our privacy guarantee uh, degrades. So let's uh, take a look at uh, the theorem statement here. So suppose that M is a differentially private algorithm. And suppose we have X and X prime, which are two data sets which differ in exactly uh, K positions. So before we were looking at K equals one, but um, now we're going to look at uh, K positions. Then for all subsets of the uh, range, we have the following. We have basically exactly the differentially, differential privacy guarantee except this time instead of this uh, epsilon that we saw for uh, dp, we're going to have a k times epsilon. So, okay, let's prove this. And this is what's known in the business as a hybrid argument. So we're going to define a series of databases which interpolate between x and x prime. So how do we do this? We're going to let x uh, sup zero, this is going to be equal to x. And we let x sup uh, k, be equal to x prime. And the idea is, look, these differ in k positions. So, you know, uh, we're going to essentially interpolate between them uh, by changing one entry each time. So kind of we had there exists uh, some x1 through xk, such that x0, uh, like x is equal to x0. And this is adjacent to some x1 is adjacent to, and so on, all the way up to x uh, sup k, uh, which is equal to x prime. And the idea is we're going to essentially like use the differential privacy guarantee and uh, interpolate between these two. So how do we do that? Let's start with what we know. We know that uh, we start with the thing that we already have. So this is just uh, running the algorithm or the mechanism on the first one. So this is on x. and We'll just use differential privacy. We know that it neighbors this uh, uh, database, which we've said exists. We haven't specifically said what it is, but it somehow is in this chain from one to the other. Uh, so we have this. And the differential privacy guarantee says we have this e to the epsilon here. Well, the idea is we just do that again. OK, so now we have this uh, algorithm run on x1. Well, we know this is adjacent to some x2, so we can use the differential privacy uh, definition once again and get out another e to the epsilon. Uh, and we just keep doing this one by one, and eventually we're going to be left with an upper bound of probability of m on x to the k. And this is going to be e to the k times epsilon as desired. This is exactly what we were trying to prove. The, the proof is concluded, I guess, by just seeing that, you know, uh, x0, uh, x0 equals x, and xk equals x prime. And so these two, the final inequality is essentially exactly what we were trying to prove here. Again, not too hard. Let's go on to the last property of differential privacy that we're going to get in today, which is called composition. Um, yeah, and this is, this is perhaps one of the more important things, which essentially quantifies uh, the cost of asking multiple queries. In particular, we know, we know kind of how to do a single query, but 
What if you want to ask multiple queries, potentially adaptively, and you want to put them together? We saw how to do this specifically for the Laplace uh, mechanism, where you can set the parameters uh, appropriately and it's going to be epsilon differentially private overall. But let's say you wanted to do some Laplace mechanism, you want to do some randomized response, you want to do some other uh, differentially private algorithms, and you want to put them all together and quantify how much privacy is lost uh, in the end. And composition theorems allow us to quantify exactly how much uh, privacy is lost in the end. Um, yeah, what this, what this is going to say, let's, let's take a look at this theorem. It says, suppose that uh, m, which is going to be a vector of algorithms, so each of these is a differentially private algorithm, m1 through mk is a sequence of epsilon differentially private algorithms, potentially chosen sequentially and adaptively. What do I mean by that? It means that maybe uh, m2, we don't pick it from right off the bat, we see what the result of m1 is on the data set, and then we pick m2. And then similarly for mk, we wait until we have seen all the results of the other previous analyses, and then we pick mk. So that's what I mean to be chosen sequentially and adaptively. The point is we just do epsilon, uh, k epsilon differentially private algorithms. Then the overall transcript of all these releases is going to be k times epsilon differentially private. So like I said, this, we already kind of showed that this, is cho this, this works for the Laplace mechanism when we have chosen all of the queries in advance. But this allows us to say that even if we cho uh, chose them by arbitrary differentially private algorithms and we uh, do them adaptively, select adaptively rather than picking them all in advance, then it's still going to be uh, differentially private overall. And so let's, let's prove this the same way we've done it you know, all the other times. We're going to simply do it from first principles. So we're going to fix two neighboring data sets, x and x prime, which are neighboring neighbors. And uh, we're going to fix some sequence of outputs, y equals y1 through yk. These are kind of the outputs of the algorithm. So this is like essentially saying the exact same thing, except instead of using uh, subsets of the range, we're just going to use a specific outcome this time, just for simplicity. So we're saying that for all possible, uh, we're, we're going to prove it for a particular x and x prime and a sequence of outputs. And then since it'll hold generically for any set of these, then it'll hold for all of them simultaneously. And therefore, we have the differential privacy guarantee. So this is fairly simple to prove. All we're going to do is look at probability that um, m on x is equal to this uh, sequence of outputs, y, divided by probability that uh, m on x prime is equal to the sequence of outputs, y. Well, how do we do this? We're just going to decompose these as we've kind of uh, done before. So we'll write this as a big product because we're going to, again, sort of do this sequentially. And it'll be done as following. So we're going to say that this is the probability that um, the ith query, the, I, the ith differentially private algorithm is going to give you yi. But since, I, like I said, these are sequential and adaptively chosen, then this might depend on you know, all the previous ones. So for example, we have here, we're conditioning on the result of uh, m1 through m on i minus one, that this is equal to uh, y1 through y i minus one. And similarly in the denominator, what we're going to do is essentially the same thing. I might, let's see if uh, write this whole thing out. X prime is equal to Y I. And we're conditioning on essentially the same thing, except with X prime in a place of X. So this is just, this was rather tedious, but essentially all we're doing is writing these uh, two things out. And now it's fairly simple to uh, conclude in the sense that, what do we know? Well, we know since the ith algorithm is differentially private, then this ratio is gonna be bounded by e to the epsilon.
and simply just you know taking this and putting it in the uh, exponent is equal to uh, e to the k times epsilon. Okay, so that's the entire proof, and this is exactly what we wanted to show that you know it's going to be k times epsilon differentially private, which we showed right here, and that's the end of the proof. So let's let's take a look, step back, and look at exactly what we proved here. We showed that if you ask k queries, then you can get away with uh, paying a factor of k in the privacy guarantee. And the surprising thing, perhaps, is that you can do better. Like this, uh, I claim that this k epsilon, this can be reduced down to something like O of square root k times epsilon. That's surprising. It it it's it decays on the square root or the cost increase in the square root of the number of queries we ask, which I consider to be a little bit surprising, especially the first time you see it. This is using something. So what we had here was basic composition, and naturally this is via something more advanced called advanced composition. So we'll see you know what where this sort of comes from a bit in the next lecture, uh, but this will take a little bit more work. In particular, we'll have to. Uh, go to a relaxation of the current differential privacy definition. That is, we're going from epsilon differential privacy or pure differential privacy to something different called uh, approximate differential privacy. But we'll leave that for next time. Thanks for joining today.